Well, it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock, we'll make a start. So um, thank you for attending. We are Corit again, which is brilliant to see. And um, for those of you who I've seen an awful lot of over the last few weeks, <laughs> thank you very much for your participation. Um, we have the final sessions later on today. I am, you know, very, very grateful to your commitments actually over this process because it has taken a lot of time and a lot of effort. So um, thank you very much indeed. OK, apologies for absence, Lindsay. Yes, Chair. We've received apologies from Councillor Chalk, Councillor Rainbow, and we should be joined by her substitute shortly, Councillor David Barker. And we've also received apologies from Councillor Wood. Thank you. Uh, we are joined today by um, Gareth Bradford in his role as not only presenting at, on the, the housing review, but he'll be joined, staying for the remainder of the session um, as the representative from the senior executive team, uh, as Laura Schoff is unable to attend today. Um, and Mark Smith from the ARIC committee is also joining us as an observer. So many thanks. First, next then, any declarations of interest? Do I have any declarations of interest that haven't been um, already recorded? No? OK, thank you. And Chair's remarks. This is obviously a public session. It is being recorded. Um, so if you can just bear that in mind, please. Um, I'm expecting this meeting probably not to take the full two hours, it is quite a light agenda, um, but that's really because of the amount of work that we've done out in the working groups that will then come to a later formal committee meeting. So I think the timings for all of today's sessions might be a little bit fluid, um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to... <laughs> we'll be able to complete um, the session hopefully in advance of the scheduled time. So if I move on to the minutes of the 11th of July, and first of all, if I take them for accuracy and then I'll take them for matters arising. So if I can take them for matters of accuracy, page one. Yeah, yep. page two. Three, four, five, and six. Sure, fine, yeah. I, I did raise a point at this meeting about my concern that the paper was a, sorry that the paper was um, ex expressing level three and above qualifications. That is not doesn't seem to be recorded anywhere. Is that normal? OK, so is that so you want that record? You want to raise that as part of the 74, the skills review? Um, indeed, so, yes. Yeah, that, no, that's fine. That's fine. We can have that added. Because otherwise so, it'll just get lost yeah, from the agenda completely. You, yes. I do remember you raising that. Thank so. you. No, that's fine. Thank you. Any other, mat any other mat um, matters of accuracy? No? OK, so if we then move back to the start, for any matters arising that won't be picked up on the formal agenda. So page one, page two. I don't think there's much need to say a great deal on the devolution deal. We're still undertaking that process, uh, a formal report based on the committee's comments, observations and recommendations will be drawn together um, and presented back to this committee. Um, so anything, any other matters arising from page three? Matters arising from page four. Dan, I think it might be worthwhile me just commenting on the review of the governance update. Thank you, Chair. Yes, that uh, work is still ongoing. Uh, so there are interviews um, with um, uh, key stakeholders. So that will include the uh, mayor portfolio leads uh, of the chairs of, of, of other committees. So that's a, a, an ongoing piece of work um, that uh, is expected to, to conclude and, and bring recommendations forward to the next uh, command authority board. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's progressing at, uh, 
at a good pace and, and uh, yeah, will be reported to the board at its next meeting. Thank you for that. Um, page five matters arising. We do have the skills on the agenda. So with the amendment um, from Councillor Burrow, I would suggest that any other issues on skills would pick up on the agenda itself. And page six. So with the one amendment, can I ask, can we um, accept that those are a true record of the last meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. OK, over then to onto the first formal agenda item. And um, this is the affordable and social housing scrutiny review recommendations that was conducted last year. Um, Councillor Waters and Councillor Actar both sat on that panel, as did Councillor People and Councillor Tricky, who are no longer members of this committee. Uh, but what we felt was really important because of the depth of the recommendations was that we had regular updates back to this committee to just keep an eye on the recommendations that were made and the follow up from those. Um, so I've got um, Rob Lamont and Gareth in Gareth Bradford's in the room. So I'm not sure who's going to take it first. Gareth? I think if I did that chair and then if, if Rob can comment if there are any further questions. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. So hopefully the paper that was submitted in your pack shows the positive progress that has been made under each of the recommendations of the review. Uh, if you don't mind, if I just take everyone through just the highlights of the positive progress that has been made. As the chair said, the recommendations of the review were fully supported by the Combined Authority Board in March of this year. And we have taken strides to make sure that each recommendation is implemented. So just firstly, on the first recommendation, which was about making sure that we write to the Secretary of State for DLUC and that this is at the forefront of our devolution deal negotiations. I'm pleased to say this is uh, as those who've been involved in the scrutiny sessions around the housing aspect of the devolution deal negotiations will, will know this is a big part of our ask around devolution from central government is to have a dedicated affordable housing funding settlement uh, similar to that that's in place in London and that the combined authority has the tools such that it can work alongside local authorities and homes England to increase the supply of affordable housing uh, genuinely affordable housing for local people and during the scrutiny review we had a quite a conversation about how important it was that that housing genuinely met local needs and the needs of individuals and recognizing the fact that the housing needs of individuals is different across such a diverse region such as the West Midlands. The second recommendation was following the positive endorsement of the committee around the Commonwealth Authority's minimum affordable housing target, but making sure that wherever possible that is aligned with the targets by local authorities. I'm pleased to say now that all schemes have progressed through the single commissioning framework. That is the framework that guides how we spend housing and land fund money in the combined authority, specifically requires the support of the local planning authority and has to ensure a minimum 20%, but we are also doing a review of the single commissioning framework under the Housing and Land Board, and we will ensure that this recommendation, recommendation two, is fully included within that review of the single commissioning framework. So we've already started to implement this in what you might call beta mode, but we want to make sure this is formally part of the SCF, and we will do that through the Housing and Land Board. Recommendation three was about best value. Uh, shortly after the committee endorsed the recommendations of this review, we launched the West Midlands Public Land Charter in May, and that does include a specific principle about taking a long term approach to the value of public land and looking at the wider benefits of public land. And again, and apologies, it's a, a, it will be a bit of a record I'll keep returning to, but the West Midlands public land ask is a big part of our devolution deal ask and we want to be a test bed for new approaches to best value in the country and new approaches to the use of public land. If we turn now to recommendation four, 
Recommendation four was all about the fact that you can't look at affordable housing supply in isolation. It's a multifaceted system and it needs a lot of agencies to come together and work as one. So again, since the review, we've set up the Combined Authority and Housing Association Partnership Board, and that is all about how housing associations and the Combined Authority can work better together to champion affordable housing, looking at the latest development and research. We've also taken continued steps towards our proposed pilot affordable housing, and I'm able to reassure the committee today that that will deliver 100% affordable housing on any scheme that the pilot takes forward. And we also want it to be an exemplar of zero carbon modular homes. We also now have 40 meetings with the Homes England team in the region, and we also continue to have six weekly meetings with every local authority across the whole region to ensure that we're clear on affordable housing priorities. Finally, just to say the Housing and Land Board has commissioned work on an affordable housing strategy. This is due to come to the Housing and Land Board in November and will come to this committee beforehand for review and comments in due course. Recommendation five was around the issue that the review recognised that social housing grant was being awarded to areas of high affordability pressure and that was impacting on other parts of the region. This does require a change to national policy and we continue through the TDD to try and influence government to make that national policy change. Similarly, your recommendation six around the viability clause. Again, we are making this part of the TDD process to have a look at what national policies need to change in order to unlock affordable housing. Recommendation seven was about the combined authority using its convening power to bring together key agencies in the region on affordable housing and as well as industry task forces and roundtables, we are holding around affordable housing. As I mentioned before, we also have the meetings with local authorities and the new Housing Association Combined Authority Board, which tries to ensure there is a positive response from housing associations to this issue. Finally, on recommendation eight, split explicit recommendation of the committee was to review the local housing allowance system, system and again, that is within the TDD asks that are going into central government. So I hope the committee feels that we've taken all the recommendations with the seriousness they deserve, and we are taking significant strides to make sure we implement every recommendation in full. The next key step will be the emerging affordable housing strategy, the review of the single commissioning framework to include that new requirement around aligning with local plan targets and the trailblazer devolution deal to achieve a new settlement around affordable housing and changes to best value on public land. Uh, Chair, I'm really happy to take any questions or ask Rob Lamond, who is our head of strategy in housing and regeneration in the combined authority and the lead in the organisation for affordable housing to answer any questions you chair or the committee may have. Thank you. Thanks very much and thanks for taking us through that and the, the progress positive progress overall that has been made on most of those recommendations. So I'll open it up. I've had uh, Councillor Waters indicate that she'd like to speak, then Councillor Tennant, then Councillor Actar. So Councillor Waters. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just have oh, two questions? Can I have the definition of uh, public land and the definition of affordable housing? What it consists of, please. Thank you. Chair, do you want me to answer each yeah, question? Yeah. So uh, public land is efficiently classed by government as land in public ownership. Uh, at the moment, that doesn't include organisations like universities and organisations such as that. It includes the organisations you expect, like councils, government agencies, those sorts of organisations. Uh, affordable housing is a strict national definition, but I just asked Rob to uh, articulate to the committee our regional affordable housing definition which was approved by the Housing and Land Board. Thanks, Gareth, and through you, Chair, yeah, just to update on the, uh, the the regional affordable definition that we implemented for our own combined authority uh, investments. So um, we took a, a wider and more broad approach to the issue of affordability. So the current national definition is very much based on what the local market rent or sale values might be, and then a proportion of that 
market or, or market or sale or rental um, figure is then uh, is then accounted for as accountable uh, as affordable. What we have done is looked at actual local household incomes, particularly in the local authority areas that we are we are looking to work, and using both those local household income levels, but also then what are the different types of requirement in the in the local area. So whether there's a requirement for key worker housing or first time. Uh, opportunities or potentially more student accommodation or more sheltered or supported accommodation factoring all of those into the kind of affordability mix as well um that as, as, as gareth rightly said that that approach was endorsed and, and approved by the housing land board and the ca board in 2019 i think it was um, and we have circulated those papers to overview and scrutiny previously but i appreciate there's there's new members on the on the scrutiny community this year as well so very happy to research those papers if helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Tennant. Good morning. Um, this is the first question uh, you may have, may have answered previously, but I am a new, a new member. So when we talk about best value, are you merely talking about financial best value or do you take into account um, the economic benefit that might generated and social environmental benefits that also may be generated? Um, and also, um, as we talk about developing more land for housing, have you had conversations with the transport department within the command party and other infrastructure partners about what options you have to open up new land for housing development that might not currently be available because it's hard to reach? Um, it's just do those two. You're very happy to answer those questions, Councillor Tennant. Those are, are two uh, really excellent questions from my point of view, because that's exactly what our strategy is about. So the first one on best value is specifically about not just the highest price for land, but about looking at wider social and economic benefits and environmental benefits of land. So the Public Land Charter specifically asks public owners to take a long term strategic approach to the disposal and development of their land and look to support inclusive growth in all that they do around public land. Um, on, your, on your second question, yes, we've got a, a joint approach here with Transport for the West Midlands, uh, and we are looking at how we can unlock land using our transport investments and our transport infrastructure corridors. Uh, one of the things in our investment prospectus earlier this year was how we use the transport infrastructure within the region to unlock new development opportunities, in both housing and commercial across the region. Chair, just just a thought. Shall I, after the committee, would you like us to share around the public land charter to all members of the committee so that colleagues could have a look at that? So yeah, I think it'd be useful that. because, as you say, you know, we've we've had a, a number of new councillors since the last time you presented papers to us, so I think it, it's not going to hurt. Uh, Councillor Raptor. Uh, thank you, Chair. <laughs> Uh, my question is around recommendation one. Have you returned to Secretary of State about our ambitions uh, in the region? And if you did, have you received any response from them? Uh, and second one is around affordable housing target. Um, I have seen over the years where developers um, basically using that loophole of maybe if it's a 25 percent of the affordable housing, the, the, the local planning authority asked them to, to do that. They basically coming up with the idea: 13% full affordable housing and 12% half rent, half buy. So they prefer to use that bit because this suit them. So I think if we go forward with full affordable housing, I think we should encourage them to implement full 25% or 20%, not half buy, half rent. Thank you. On your first question, we've certainly had positive support from officials within government departments. Um, there's obviously quite a change going on at the moment. Um, previous ministerial team was also supportive of our last around affordable housing and supported with some of the principles. We'll obviously wait for the, the new government to be formed. And again, like I said, this is one of our top asks around the, the TDD is to secure more affordable housing funding for the region. Um, we've certainly got as well support from National Housing Federation, housing associations as well, um, and industry across the region where the issue of 
housing supply and affordable housing is becoming a much broader economic issue as well. So we certainly have those through things like our commercial property task force councillor. Um, on your second question, because we're not a planning authority and we are investing funds on behalf of, of the taxpayer, we are able in the combined authority to set a minimum non-negotiable 20% affordable housing target. So our, we never go below 20%, so we never get to 19 or 18, because it's actually a formal condition of our funding. So no one gets to the first stage of our funding process unless they're willing to commit to 20% affordable housing that meets the definition that Rob referred to uh, earlier on, Councillor. But you're right, we do need to be careful and uh, very robust about making sure that that affordable housing is genuinely affordable housing. Uh, at least 20 percent. We're actually, I think it says it in the paper, but at the moment we're at 26 percent is actually the average across all the developed housing and land fund programs. So we're slightly above the 20 percent minimum target at the moment. And obviously our our goal is to make that higher and, and higher. And I, I want the recommendation that the committee made about aligning with local plan targets will hope, help get that target higher and higher, we hope. Thank you. Councillor Sutherland next. Thank you, Chair. And it reflects the last question because um, that's exactly my question. Uh, it says here that um, on recommendation two, um, item seven, that um, WMCA work to ensure the affordable housing element of each scheme that reflects the priorities of the local planning uh, uh, authority with the 20% target being the uh, minimum requirement that to me uh, is there an opportunity to move that target and i know you said there will be government but if the average is 26 i just think that uh, you're aiming low when we need to be aiming high so that that's just a question i don't know if, if we could uh, do that and may I, i've got another question yep. but that's um and uh, uh, recommendation four and that the um, work is ongoing on the proposed pilot affordable housing project and are there one is there one pilot or are there many pilots and, and where are they located that, that, that that's what I'm asking on that on that one thank you thank you chair if I could answer the, the first question so because this programme at the moment is nearly entirely brownfield sites, the most difficult to deliver sites within the region that face significant viability constraints, but they would normally not do a very high level of affordable housing at all um, under the viability issue that happens through the planning process. So achieving a minimum 20% and now 26% is, is quite an achievement from where we've historically been, but we can definitely take that away. And I would also say that Going back to my point about the region being so diverse, one of the things we are looking at is we've got a minimum 20%, average 26%, but in some parts of the region, the viability may allow for us to achieve a higher affordable housing rate than in other areas. So we, we also need to be flexible. And one of the things that came out of the review was securing Homes England grant. It's a scheme securing national government grant to help increase that affordable housing supply even further from what the combined authority can support. On the affordable housing uh, pilot, at the moment we haven't started a pilot. Um, we've got one scheme called Help to Own, which is the Marches in Wolverhampton, which has been very successful as an affordable housing pilot. Um, we've been very pleased with the progress that that's, that's made and the impact it's had on, on local people within the local area. Um, but we're currently working on a, another affordable housing pilot um, which again, come back to Councillor Tennant's point, we're trying to make sure it's linked to transport corridors and linked to sites that are along transport corridors. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you would like to add anything further on the pilot to the <coughs> Councillor's question. Thanks, Gareth. Yeah, through you, Chair, just to say the pilot that's that's referred to on the recommendation four is um, with a, a group of some of the major housing associations in the region that we're looking to bring forward a number of schemes with that group 
So they're not actually confirmed schemes as yet, but we are working through the details of those. And when we've got to the kind of business case point, we'll bring that business case through to the committee to follow up on the both the recommendations of this report and the previous um, uh, reports that have been made to the committee on the, the development of that work with the Housing Association. So I can't confirm where the, the, the potential schemes might be at this stage, but certainly to say that the ongoing work um, is making a lot of progress and we're, we're quite um, we're, well, we're very positive that we'll be able to provide more detail to the committee in, in short in short course. And just go back to the members question though, but what the housing and land board have committed to and we're following through with the pilot is that those pilots will be 100 percent affordable housing yeah. and they will be an exemplar of zero carbon homes within the region. That's that's our top goal. I think through you, Chair, if I could just respond to that, um, particularly interested in uh, what is become uh, where, where good practice um, uh, and equally the trials and tribulations of um, these pilots because we've got a lot of uh, parochially in Cannock Chase we've got an exciting opportunity and we want to get it right first time if, 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 if we can so any help that uh, you can give us would be much uh, much welcome thank you thank you Chair before calling Councillor McCarthy, if I can just pick up on that discussion around recommendation four. I mean, we do want, I've spoken to um, Lindsay about a future meeting, reporting back on the progress of the modular homes. So it might be, we might be able to combine the two. Um, and I think what we'd be interested in, in terms of recommendation four and, and pilot schemes is timeframes. Um, but certainly um, the, the progress on modular and the progress on uh, zero carbon with that. So, Councillor McCarthy. Could you outline the, uh, the policy for ensuring that this affordable housing also has an affordable energy bill? Because the two things come together as to what is affordable, because if you've got huge energy bills, you haven't got much in the uh, budget left for uh, energy housing. Yeah, it's one of the questions we're really looking at in quite close scrutiny at the moment. Our schemes are affordable housing in perpetuity through the funding and legal agreements we sign with each developer or with each applicant, but the issue around energy efficiency of the homes. So one of the things we've committed to do under the Housing and Land Board is produce a future house building strategy, which is around trying to achieve ahead of the government's future homes targets so the government set out that in 2025, the building regulations will be changed so that all houses will have to meet a certain energy efficiency level. We would like to go two years ahead of that energy efficiency target within our region so that we can lead the way in terms of the issues that you, you've raised, Councillor. Uh, we're currently working on a strategy with Mark Farmer, who's the government's chief independent advisor around future house building. And we are hoping to bring recommendations through to both this committee and to the Housing and Land Board on how we might do that and get ahead of what is going to be a national change to building regulations. At the moment, affordable housing has to meet the energy efficiency targets set by the social housing regulator. But again, we want to go further and faster than the national changes that are going to come forward in 2025 because we think it's an urgent issue now and it can't wait to 2025. I mean, one of the things that we talk about frequently discuss in this room is retrofitting for, for net zero. Can we not call a proportion of that funding forward to enable us to meet those targets? So, so one of our main TDD asks, sorry, Trailblazer Devolution Deal asks is about funding for retrofit so that we can have a bigger retrofit program across the region than we've currently got. Uh, what this refers to is new build housing and clearly we don't want to make the situation any worse by building new homes that aren't to the highest energy efficiency standard. Um, but retrofit is one of the issues that's been looked at as part of the devolution deal negotiations. But to ju just to close this this one off, we're not considering the possibility that we at the moment still building homes that will need retrofitting. And it would be more logical to when we build the new homes to invest. Certainly, if we secure the government funding that we're asking for, Councillor, we would definitely be looking to do a much wider programme. Uh, it, it's, as I said, this is one of our flagship asks within the devolution deal process to secure more government funding 
around this agenda. Um, I think the only other point that I would raise is we're also looking at how we can unlock private sector investment into both retrofit and affordable housing supply more generally as well. Thank you. Uh, and I think just to comment, just to additionally comment on that, um, you know, I know we've talked about it in the TDD deal about the additionality of, um, you know, we talked about broadband, we talked about uh, net zero carbon standards and about what we connect, what powers we have as a region um, on planning and planners. And I know that's we'll, we should get some further information on that because I think a lot of our ambition versus what the, the current powers are to insist on things, might there might be a bit of a variation in that. Um, Councillor Burrow. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one quick comment on building standards. 15 years ago, the comp company I worked for, a large French multinational, built a row of six houses in France. Total energy costs 100 euros a year. That's what they were designed to do with their existing building products portfolio. I guess that would be £300 a year now. But, I mean, we'd die, wouldn't we, all of us, to have a £300 a year energy. But this stuff is actually not difficult to do. On the... On the um, recommendation four, you talk about talking to um, various representative bodies. I just wanted to check um, arms houses. Now, they happen to be a particular thing in my the particular ward in which I, I live, but I don't know how big they are across the West Midlands, but they are fairly significant across the UK. Do you ever consult with arms houses about them building their needs? Um, now, a lot of them will probably be in housing association representative bodies, but my impression from talking to the couple in my area is that their approach is significantly different from the big housing associations, and they might be able to make a contribution that will be different and helpful. So uh, it's just a suggestion you might want to, there is a National Arms House Association and they do build for very specific needs, often young people, deprived people, retired people. A lot depends on what their terms of reference are, but they can make quite a contribution for certain segments of need. Thank you. Um, could I ask the council tenant? Yeah, I did see. I wasn't sure if I'd seen you indicate. Yes, the final one for me. Um, so kind of within the, the devolution deal, so over the past decade, councils have lost a bunch of powers around regulating the private rented sector. Um, in my world, this is called a significant problem, uh, both a bit with students, but largely for exempt accommodation stuff. Um, within the devolution deal, um, are we asked that power now rests with the Secretary of State, who cannot regulate in his own private office the entire exempt accommodation in England. Are we asking for those powers to come back down as part of the devolution deal? Not through the combined authority at the moment, Council. No. Um, so we we're, we're obviously looking at things that the combined authority is trying to draw down from government to the regional level that are currently decided at a national level. Um, that hasn't been, but we can make sure that it's raised if you can. Do I have anybody else indicating that they'd like, oh Vera, sorry Vera. It's all right. Thank you Chair. I'd just like to put, shine a bit of light on arms houses. I've sat on arms houses committees. Arms houses are actually, they are independent, however there's an, always an housing association that is actually linked with them. They're actually oversees the general maintenance and so forth and that on on the what's the name so but uh, in Walsall we've got a few different what's the names of arms houses but they've not built any new ones recently so it will be something worth looking at because it works out totally different to an housing association because they do tend to 
taking people with more needs out to relate to the churches and places like that and they take people from the, from that so it is a good because I expect we'll have a look into that chair on both of those items thank you okay and um how will that be reported back to committee members well i think we can report it back through the affordable housing strategy chair because it sounds like most house houses are linked to a housing association, which is my understanding as well. But it's it's whether we can get the collective of housing associations to recognise the benefit of arms houses and also the potential new build opportunity of arms houses. So it needs to be part of our affordable housing strategy. Thank you for that. Do I have any other councillors indicating that they want to speak against this item? No, um, I'm just to make I'm obviously for those people who've been at the um, various TDD meetings, there's a number of asks that we've that you've made, obviously, that expand on um, many of these recommendations. So that's really positive to see and to see how that develops. Um, just to make the committee aware that uh, going back to the summer of well, June, we had communication from um, Shelter in relation to the review. That letter went directly to Councillor Trickett um, and copied to myself, but now as chair, um, we're trying to do a little bit of research around that and about local authority provision for the um, for, for, for traveller uh, communities and um, transit sites and accessibility to other services from those sites. So we're doing a bit of research behind the scenes on that before we respond to shelter. Um, but just to make people aware that we'd have that communication. OK, so if I've got no further questions, then we'll close that item. And um, so much of the progress that we require will be reported, I think, through the, through the trial blazer devolution deal programme. Um, and obviously, dependent on how that goes, um, we'll see response back from yourselves, Gareth and Rob. Okay, so moving then on to the scrutiny review and the scoping document, you'll recall that this came to the previous committee um, and a number of comments were made in relation to that um, and the scoping document has been redrafted <coughs> to reflect those comments that were made. Um, so we thought it would be worth bringing it to this committee again, just for it to be formally agreed, any further questions or additions in advance of the skills working group um, being convened slightly in the autumn of this year. So Claire, over to yourself. Morning, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, um, just bringing back uh, to reflect the scoping doc in the scoping document, some of the um, discussion we had last time made some slight changes, one to include the relative distribution um, of the budget in light of economic challenge. Um, so we've, we've strengthened that and put that into the scope of review. We've made some changes to the wording around the um, the drivers of um, future skills needs, um, particularly relating to businesses and particularly drawing on the distinction between uh, qualifications, levels, non-qualification or, or certification provision to cover that, to, to look at how the budget is being used um, to fund the most appropriate skills for people to get into work and to meet business needs as well. Um, and then we've strengthened the final bullet point around looking at career pathways as well, because that came through. And then finally, in terms of expert uh, witnesses, we've included that we should ask um, someone from the business community with a view of skills to get some input, maybe a representative group or something to make sure we get some, some input from business as well into the review. So those are a quick summary of the changes and happy to take any questions or comments or feedback. So I'll open it up to the committee in terms of um, the additions that have been made and whether we think that this is sort of the final chance, if you like, to make sure that we are happy with this scoping document before we move forward. So any questions, comments or additions from the committee? Councillor McCarthy? Which part, of, which part of business are you going to uh, call this uh, sort of in, input from? Could we look for a company that does a lot of installation of uh, sort of modern uh, grain based heat pumps and that kind of thing and talk about the skills that uh, they have and their pit based heat pumps? 
we we could do i think our, our initial thinking was more of a representative um body um that could represent a sort of a broader section of employers rather than just a, a niche sector but happy to take as they views and guidance so probably we're thinking more of chambers or um fsb um etc maybe construction Happy, but again, it's just that representative of, of only one sector, isn't it? I think because the adult education budget covers jobs and and um, training across all sectors, I think we'd be looking for a maybe a sort of broader membership body. Or maybe more than one body. Potentially. Okay. Any other comments from people? Councillor Waters. I'd just like to say it's absolutely fantastic to hear what we discussed has actually been taken on board and actually everything you've said is what I remember being asked and it's fantastic to hear you've actually taken on board what was being said. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think for me it's really important that this um, skills review looks at the value across the region um, and I'm, you know, certainly the authority I'm from, and I think it's we, we pick this up in the Black Country review, and it also comes back to um, Councillor Burroughs' comments earlier about the levels of skills. Yeah, you know, I'm from an authority which has um, an overrepresentation of need at entry level up to level two. Um, so whilst you know I appreciate the importance. Of the whole range of skills that we need across the region um, it's really critical for me that my residents actually get access to those initial lower level skills in order to be able to progress and move through um, so i think that you know any skills review has to encompass the read the specific needs of areas of um, the region that we represent now you know, luckily we've got, I think we've got a fairly broad representative group who are going to be sitting, geographically representative members who are going to be sitting on the, the skills review group. So hopefully that will be picked up and ensure that that is part of it. But I think, you know, we do have some really clear um, skills challenges within certain areas um, and, and certainly the Black Country and Dudley are one of those, those challenges. Anything from anybody else? No? Okay, well thank you very much Claire for your time this morning. We will, um, Lindsay will be in touch shortly to look at convening that skills working group. Um, the time frame for it will be to report to overview and scrutiny I think at the January meeting so that it gets into the CA board no later than March so that it can be heard and agreed before we move into PERDA period. Feels like we're wishing our life away, doesn't it? <laughs> we're only in September, but there we are. Um, so that, that will be the time frame. Um, so those people who've indicated that they'd like to be part of that group, the work will commence um, in June in October. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. So moving swiftly on then, grant register case over to you. Apologies, my arms weren't quite as long as I thought they were there. Um, just the grant register uh, is with you as it is uh, usually every month. Relatively quiet in terms of updates uh, for this kind of update here, probably reflective of the fact it's over the summer period. Um, so Parliament has been on holiday and also uh, with what is kind of something going on in the government as well. Um, for there. So just two grants to note of new, both revenue grants, so one for the Black Country Cultural Capital Development, which is uh, supporting development of projects in Samuel, Warsaw, Wolverhampton and Dudley from the Arts Council, um, and the Rough Sleeping Initiative, so 1.5 uh, well, million over three years. So we previously had a grant uh, for this area and this grant allows us to continue that work, but it starts to uh, move some of the focus around long-term recovery and prevention within that area rather than the immediate uh, pieces on there. Nothing else of significance to report uh, currently. Have to take questions. Any questions on the grant register? Jeff, Councillor Tennant. 
Thanks for that. Um, so the, the Love Sleeping Initiative, you, you talked about what its aims, what exactly are we spending that money on? I mean, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, so Munso is largely that the sort of money is spent, um, so it is a continuing initiative, I think it pays for uh, some staff costs for staff to, to deliver those um, initiatives, but certainly we can get some more information from that team around specifically what that plan is for spending, because there is a comprehensive spending plan that it's providing. That would be useful to see because um, obviously provision for rough sleep is sits with local authorities so um, how that that grant is then being devolved um, and where, where finance finance sits given as we say it's the responsibility of local authorities um, so it'd be useful to see the, the, the funding from a CA perspective. Yeah, just and that is different from the homelessness funding, which does get perhaps right. ported out to local authorities. So it is different to that funding part. Okay, thank you. Anything else on the grant register from anybody? Just, just a quick one. Okay. Adult education budget level three. It says devolved budget from DFV for delivery of level three education open of open to. What's the rest of it? Uh, offer open to adults without an existing level three qualification uh, in the West Midlands. That's what it works a lot. Anything else from anybody? Yeah, Councillor Sutherland. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a question for uh, relating to non. Uh, uh, local authorities have an access to any of these funds and uh, if so how do we go about it because I'm not sure particularly in Canic Chase that uh, we take advantage um, but I won't say all of them but uh, heard them once and I've seen one or two in here that um, I think we could uh, uh, hopefully apply for. So um, the funds, so when the funds come, we will, uh, I guess, distribute those in ways that they mean. Sometimes we are limited where we can use those funds geographically, so that will uh, limit us in terms of what we can do, and that does limit the access. Sometimes that non-cons are able to, to have into those funds, but um, all funds, if they are distributed, so not some funds will be distributed or passported into other um bodies, not always LA, sometimes third sector to deliver activity and that will be done through usually a, a process um, going through procurement. Otherwise sometimes it's activity that is delivered specifically by West Midlands combined authority so that money stays with, within us and we deliver the activity. So for example the AEB budget which goes um, subject to Inclair. But if there are any are specific funds that you'd like to, to have a conversation then we'd be happy to take those and take those through to the relevant offices. Thank you. I'd, I'd also be interested in looking at in the um, sustainable warmth grants. So, what what's that? Who does it go to? How does it get devolved? Is it to devolve it, or is it um, regional level work that is being done attached to that? I can get the details. I believe that one is about a specific area. I think that was a specific regional area bit that was put in for that. Um, for that one, so I'll just grab the details and see. I won't quote myself on that one just in case. Thank you. Councillor Tennant, did I just catch your? You indicated no. Councillor Fenton. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd be interested to hear how the technical boot camps are tying in with the devolved level three training um, and in particular which industry training within those technical boot camps is, is sitting on the top what are people taking advantage of thank you we can certainly pick that up with the the skills team around some further detail on the um, boot camp so um for this year i think there were particular industries that have been specified by the the government funding but it was wider i believe than previous years and then we can certainly get some detail around and take upon those thank you thank you um and obviously should the um devolution deal be uh, successful then we're hoping that the grant register will appear somewhat differently in the future 
um, and be a lot more um, shorter, shorter, <laughs> um, a lot less onerous, um, and a lot more flexible. So oh, that's the, the main ask, obviously, of government that we have uh, funding and devolved funding in a much more simplified and more flexible um, manner than it currently is. So if I've got no further questions on that, I'll move on to the minutes of Transport Scrutiny Subcommittee. And these minutes are for um, to be agreed by today's committee. Um, I don't think we were chorus. We were. Right, we were chorus. So right, I should know as I was chairing it, but it seems to be a long time ago. Gosh, with everything that's happened over the last few weeks. So um, th these minutes are just for approval um, and we have a further team transport sub scrutiny subcommittee on um, Thursday of this week. Thank you. And that moves us then on to the overview and scrutiny work programme for 2022-23. Um, we've discussed a number of things this morning that I think we want some feedback and report back on. Um, particularly the uh, progress and development of modular housing uh, across the region because I think when I first became, sat on this committee, modular housing was a, a real big seller at that point. It really um, hailed as um, a solution to our housing um, issues. So I think we need to have an update on that. So that will be coming at a, a later stage. Um, You'll see that we the next formal committee, the next formal meeting of this committee will be the Mayor's question time policy on the 20th of October. We will have a workshop prior to that, which I think will be on Teams, um, and I would encourage people to attend that just so that we can start to formulate our questions on policy and around some of the trailblazer asks uh, to put to the Mayor at that public session. Um, as I said earlier, we do need to fit in an additional meeting in order to agree the report that will be conclude, completed from this recommendations around the Trailblazer devolution deal. So scrutiny will submit a report. It will have um, all of the comments that we've made as, as appendices, along with any um, recommendations and observations that we want to add into that. But in order for that to go before the board, which I believe has been a special meeting convened for the end of October, um, we will need to fit in uh, an additional scrutiny meeting to ratify that. So Dan, do you want to comment on that? Yes, thank you, Chair. And if, if, if I can help, since, since these papers were issued, there has been a change to the combined authority board uh, meeting schedule. So originally it was planned to meet on the 16th of September and then an additional special meeting to be scheduled in October, particularly to consider the uh, devolution deal submission to government. So, so the mayor and the chief executive have been discussing this uh, last week, and it's, it's now been agreed that actually rather than holding two meetings, they can be combined into one. So that the time criticality is around the October meeting. So what that means is that the 16th of September combined authority board effectively is cancelled the items of business that were going to that meeting that, that weren't specifically time critical for September will now go to an October board um, and the date that that is going to be is the 28th of October. So that board meeting will consider effectively September's um, business. But in addition to that, uh, as you've said, the, the devolution deal submission to government will be agreed at that 28th of October CA board along with a uh, report on the shared prosperity fund submission so what that that i think is helpful to, to this committee mm -hmm. because it does mean that you could hold a, a, a an additional meeting yourselves and, and discussions mm -hmm. and suggesting around the 17th of october but will allow you to see those reports in a finished state but before they then go on to the combined authority board on the 28th of october Thanks, Dan. I hope that's um, sort of put the concept, the context for that. So the special meeting of scrutiny will take place on the 17th of October here. It will cover the Trailblazer Devolution Deal uh, final report, including scrutiny's report, and also the um, 
shared prosperity, gone completely out of my mind. <laughs> the shared prosperity um, paper as well. Um, that's obviously going to be really important in terms of the um, the skills devolution as well going forward. So um, that that will take place on the seventeenth. So if you can add that to your diary, and I, I do. I am aware that you know scrutiny normally only has um, six meetings a year. Um, so we have, we are increasing the workload. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, Lindsay's just told me that we suggest in two p.m. on the seventeenth. So there you go, Vera. <laughs> two two p.m. on the seventeenth. That will be here because it's a formal meeting. Um, in order to be core, we will need people present in the room. So it will be um, you know a formal meeting of this board. Chair, yeah, just following this meeting, then we'll, we'll send around formal notification of that. So believe you could perhaps yeah. note it now, and then we'll send a, an email round confirming those details. So you've got them uh, in your inbox. Thanks. Okay, so thanks everybody for that, and thanks for your contributions this morning. I did say it would be a, a reasonably short and sweet meeting. Um, we are going to move into the next working group session, which will be um, not open to the public and won't be recorded. Uh, and that will be to look at uh, the, the next part of the trailblazer devolution deal. So I suggest that we have perhaps um, a 10 minute comfort break, get a drink, literally, uh, and then we will reconvene at 10 past 11. And um, Lindsay will put a call to any officers that we need to support the next stage. So see you all shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.